Welcome to one of the largest pyramids in the entire world, Teotihuacan in Mexico, right by Mexico City. Today we're going to explore these grand pyramids and learn about its mysteries, its history, and what we know about these people that now we know as Teotihuacanos. I'm Ariel, this is Urbanist. Let me know where you're watching from and we're joined by a very special guest today of Mexico Underground. Uh, he is a friend of Yubish and a colleague and I'm so excited to show you this amazing place, a place of mystery and legends as well. I'm Ariel, this is Urbanist and let's go. So welcome everyone, I am joined. This is Mike, who will be filming on the side. So thank you so much, Mike. And this is Rodrigo. And you are an anthropologist and a tour guide. That's right, yes. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about where are we located right now and what do you usually do in this site of Teotihuacan? We are located right now in one of the most exciting, most amazing archaeological sites in Mexico. Uh, we are just a little bit away, uh, just uh, outside Mexico City for about 35, 38 miles from Mexico City, northeast. But what I, I would like to say always is that uh, the most exciting part is that we are also traveling in time in past for about 2,000 years. Right. The place where we are standing is the famous pyramid known as Teotihuacan or Teotihuacan. And this is a name that was given to this archaeological site in recent years after the, the, the explorings by archaeologists and historians. It is a word that comes from the Aztec language or the Mexica language of Nahuatl. And that means the place or the city of gods or the place where men and women become gods as well. There is actually a little trick in that translation because of that. But it's super exciting to be standing here in this recently discovered and as actually I heard you say, yes, the fact about Teotihuacan is actually that there's no fact. So there is a lot more of mystery here than actually uh, accountable or, or written down uh, data that we can confirm so far. So what I have here for you, it's a, a large compilation of theories and, and hypotheses that will both come from the academic side, from those guys that are like the authorities on the research, but also some others that are also putting together some other theories within the academy that are not as favored as the great masters, of course. No? So try to understand and try to like make a dialogue between these two theories and whatever is showing or coming up and as more or recent discoveries as research and investigation happens or still on goes uh, till this day. Fascinating. Okay, so here we're starting to see all the ruins. That's right, right. yes. Yeah, and actually, uh, I mean, like, I, I ex excuse my, my bad uh, uh, education. I would like yeah. to say hi to all your audience as well. Yeah. Hola a todos, hello from Teotihuacan in Mexico City. Yeah, this is just one of the axes, one of the main, there's, there's five axes to the side of Teotihuacan. We are right now coming, coming through the gate number three. And there's really exciting because this is part of the complex or compound of construction that was found uh, in better shape as they were con completing the excavations just a few decades ago, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is one of the main accesses to come right in front of the Temple of the Moon and the Moon Pyramid Square. I want to be able to show in, in this uh, conversation, we'll, uh, I will explain to you why these names came to be the moon and the sun, but right. also why they were not really built to praise or favor the moon and the sun originally. That remains to be a mystery, but we know that they were associated with divine and powerful forces also connecting to the feminine and the masculine for some reason. No? This area here is considered to be like one of the palaces or areas for the elite or the high class of the Teotihuacan people. It's just a theory as well. It was the discovered and then rebuilt. Also important to tell to all of your audience as well. Every yeah. time you look at the, the ruins and when you get to see, probably it's visible for you, but every time you get to see these smaller rocks or pebbles between the bigger rocks as a pattern, you see, this is a sign of reconstruction. No? So one of the things that we do know for sure about Teotihuacan is that it's one of the f uh, small uh, or little areas or places in Mexico that was intensively rebuilt thanks to the commission of a president or a ruler about 120 years ago that wanted to make Teotihuacan one of the major attractions for tourists at that time, especially coming from Europe, the US or the rest of the world. So the reconstruction of Teotihuacan was commissioned by this dictator. His name was Porfirio Diaz and he was trying to like pimp the archaeological site. Right. So this sign of the pebbles is going to be the sign of reconstruction either 100 years ago or a few decades ago. But everywhere else, your audience and you today, we can see the places where there's no sign 
of reconstruction, that is going to be original. Oh. Here and in the entire site, patterns, reconstruction, no pattern, original, plaster and stucco. No? Oh. Most important or super important to say, the most important or common material of construction, the rocks that you have in front of you all come from volcanic activity. This is volcanic stone, yeah. volcanic rocks. The quarries and the banks of these stones or, or rocks are going to be found within the perimeter. That's because we are right now, even hard to believe, in the high plains of Mexico and very close to a mountain mm. range known as the volcanic belt of Mexico, where there's more than 3,000 volcanoes surviving. So we see, we see some of the mountain ranges behind. That's right, there. yeah, we yeah. can see the mountain ranges behind. Yeah. There's a uh, one of the soon. big mountain formation over there. Even on the left, that's yeah. a small hill as well, right? And as, as soon as we get more like into an open space, we will be able to see and contemplate a couple more mountains too. Some right. of them volcanic. And then the remains and the, uh, the, the, the quarries of these stones are very close to this site. That's why the Teotihuacans, along with many other civilizations living around here in a different time of uh, in history, yeah. were using volcanic stone as the construction material. It's easy to work with. It's, uh, in, it's resistant as well, but it's also porous and light because of the bubbles of air that once were there. You can see the porous there. Oh, here it is, yeah. Yeah, you can see that those, those holes, those, those were occupied by little bubbles of air. So when you work, or these ones, for example, no? And the bu bubbles are pretty big. So there's two types of main types of kind of rock. Which one's mostly this one? It's the, it, well, one, the red one's called Tesontle and the black one uh, has a different name, uh, but it's, uh, they're Tesontle. both, okay. they're, they're both uh, the same type, no? Yeah. But uh, the cool thing is that it's very light to move, mm. you know? So it's not like basalt or, or this other big, like granite, where moving those big pieces of blocks are, was a very challenging thing, no? So in this case, it was also very convenient for them be, being able to find the rocks in the proximity right. and also being able to like either chop them like this and then use them as their bricks so to say. After the bricks or the rocks were in place, the Teotihuacan people uh, plaster the walls, and you can see a little bit around here, they plaster their walls with a, a stucco, which mm. is a, a plaster made mostly of the gravel of the same rock. It's similar to the concrete nowadays we use nowadays, and using also cactus goo or sap of cactus, a turkey, egg white, and a couple more ingredients to make the, 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 the plaster, then cover the whole surface with that. And finally, uh, a limestone layer, also brought from a different area, more uh, closer to the ocean, you know, limestone is closer to the ocean, the Mayan region, and then they would paint on it. Mm. So the really cool thing is to understand and try to uh, imagine that Teotihuacan at its pinnacle uh, was all covered in paint. You couldn't really see the volcanic rocks at all. Okay. Well, so they would have had colors. They would have had colors. Would they have been vibrant colors or? They, they or would have a very colors. large palette of colors, depending okay. also on the, on the phases of construction of Teotihuacan. So as I was mentioning before, guys, Teotihuacan was built around year, well, the people that started settling here as tribes that were putting together the first constructions were happening around the year 100 BC. Right. The pinnacle of Teotihuacan was kind of like reached around year 250, 300 AC. Okay, wow. Teotihuacan is also so very important. Yeah, so for, for comparison, that's right around the age of the Roman Empire. Yes, like towards the latter years. Exactly, yeah. and also even the, the pinnacle of Teotihuacan would be a lot closer, more to like the Nicaea Council, wow, where cool. the Roman Empire was already like losing power, and it was going to make Catholicism or Christianity the new way of, of, of power. No? Around that time, it's when the pinnacle of Teotihuacan was flourishing. Important to mention, guys, Teotihuacan, apart from just being a couple of pyramids that people wonder, gaze at them, uh, wondering who built this or why are they, why they are here, Teotihuacan was in reality one of the biggest cities in the world at that time. Mm. Okay? Temple of the Sun was being built together with the Colosseum in Rome. Right. That's like in, in chronologically speaking, the, around the time it was happening. Okay? But, but the Tihuacan as a city was bigger than Rome yeah. at that time. So yeah. that's, that's incredible to, to understand. Teotihuacan yeah. was comprising about 14 square miles yeah. of distance. The majority of the constructions of the Teotihuacan civilization and the people who lived here are now buried by strata of dirt mm. and also buried by five different villages that are surviving in the perimeter of the archaeological site.
So if we were to like open up the streets of these villages like San Francisco or San Martin, we would be able to, re to find the remains of the structures of the Teotihuacan uh, compounds or, or condo complexes or apartment complexes or you name it, no? their houses and their <laughs> public spaces as well. This wow. one is one of those, but this one was of a, of a higher, probably a higher level of higher importance due to the proximity to the, uh, to the, the sacred precinct or the colossal uh, monuments, like in this case, the Pyramid of the Moon, mm. you know, the Temple of the Moon. Fascinating. So let me say hi to everyone before we keep on walking. Hello, B. Griffin. Hello, SF Fields. I'm, I'm streaming 360p because uh, I don't want to take the risk of losing connection. I want to give you at least something live, but there will be an HD version. So give your hearts to uh, Mike for recording an HD version uh, right behind us. And uh, Rod uh, Rodrigo is part of Mexico Underground. So he is associated with Yubish. That's his colleague. That's right. Um, so same company and they do all these variety of different tours. So let me know where you're watching from. And I love that a lot, a lot of people like Ronald B. Griffin are fascinated that uh, there was cactus being involved in construction material. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. absolutely. No. Actually, there's cactus involved in everything in Teotihuacan. Yeah. No? Like uh, the ancient, uh, the oldest alcoholic drink ever consumed by, by Native Americans comes from a cactus. Yes. Comes from agave and it predates tequila and mezcal. However, uh, Are you some referring to recent... pulque? Yes, I'm yes. talking about pulque. The drink of the gods. The drink of the gods, yeah. exactly. The word, the word in, in, the in the ancient language of Nahuatl, which was the Mexica la language, the word for pulque is octli. Octli, okay. Octli means like liquor or, or, or elixir. And it's also one of the words that it's used to comprise or to come up with the name of the so-called god of rain, Tlaloc. Uh, yes. Tlali means soil in Nahuatl. Octli means pulque, liquor, elixir. When you put those words together, you get Tlalocli or Tlaliocli, Tlaloc, the elixir of the soil. Oh, it's wow. rain itself. I see. So, so I'm a, personally, he's my favorite god of the, of absolutely. the Americans. Yes, and here uh, it is. Let me, let me show everything first, the 360. So we're seeing all the different, uh, we're seeing all the valley. Right there, what temple are we seeing right in that direction? We're, 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 we're gazing at the temple of the sun in that direction. So That's located that on the east side. And then right down there, lots of valleys, lots of towns surrounding it. That's part of the mountain range where some of the mud volcanoes, actually there is a very clear one over there. Yeah. And we have a jaguar nearby. Yes. Be <laughs> ready, are... be ready to run away. <laughs> <laughs> so this is our first stop over here. And that's the yeah. Temple of the Moon. Wow. Now we used to be able to walk the top of it. I did myself 15 years ago, uh, but right now it is closed. Yes, right now because of COVID, uh, the pandemic, no? This is the new breaking point of, 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 uh, of history. Human history is like before COVID and after COVID. So there's COVID, just a leg. Right? We got to jump? Yeah, we got to jump oh, there. Oh, no. There's, there's <laughs> <laughs> this is the sacrificial beginning, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Whoever survives will make it. So we're going to be like uh, Koyoshaki? Koyoshaki, exactly. Yeah, being like rolling down the temple as you get un uh, dismembered, right? <laughs> right. I heard a pro tip with these very narrow steps is to walk sideways. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there's a there's a lot of different explanations that uh, people have come up with. It's, it's mostly like the locals and archaeologists like that are like uh, into these ideas. I would like to show you real quick this over here. Uh, Let's move a little bit further away because of that service. Maybe it's because we're surrounded by all the things. Sure. So yeah, like some, some people say that you were meant to walk uh, sideways, like recreating the moving of a snake. Yeah. So people say that it was so that Perfect. you didn't have... So what do you, what do you want? Uh, let me say, uh, Sarah, thank you so much for becoming a new member. Everyone give hearts to Sarah. Okay, so I can zoom in from here. Oh yeah, well yeah. That, that plate only showed us because we were having a, a conversation and something we were talking about is the symbolism behind the pyramids is very powerful and it also has to do with the, the cosmovision of these civilizations as they understood the cosmos. Cosmos uh, divided in three levels mostly. There was the upper levels, or known as the heavens or the skies, right? The physical world, which is the one we live on, no? we experience life on the physical world in the middle. And finally, the underworld, no? which was not hell, 
not punishment, no devil pinching your ass for eternity. Okay. It was just the below <laughs> section, no? And that also was in a way related to death, related to darkness, but it was also related to fertility, to life and to afterlife, like life after death in a way. Mm. Not in a different uh, layer or realm, but here as well, no? like from death comes life. After the dry season, the wet season comes. In this case, the temples, the pyramids have been built on top of a man-made uh, cave. Or, or chamber. And the glyph that I wanted to show you over there actually shows that. In the symbolic wow. way, the temple or the pyramid yeah. has been built on top of a chamber or a cave that represents or resembles the underworld. Right. So let me interrupt you there. We, uh, the stream crashed. <laughs> oh. We got, 15, we got 15 good minutes, which was nice. Let's see if we get better service down there. Sure. And I'll restart it. And we'll just talk about that temple. Um, I'm in 4G, on, on but only one bar. Two and we'll bars. stay in one spot if we have good service down there. So as as I'm doing that, continue guiding people around as if it were this ah, camera. Okay. Yeah. Sure, yeah. So we were saying about um, yeah the, the symbolism of the pyramid or the symbolism of the temple. It's, uh, it's important to, 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 to talk about the discoveries that were uh, brought or brought some light onto the understanding of these temples or these pyramids better, since there is the presence not only on this one, but in the three different pyramids that we have here. Actually, there is a third one far down in the bottom of uh, the southern portion of the, of the Avenue of the Dead or the archaeological site. Uh, the three of them have a chamber or a cave right below the, the pyramid, you know, trying to recreate or represent or resemble the concept of the underworld and also the place where some underground waters rest okay so there's a lot of symbolism that comes around caves like men came from caves those are the gates or the access to the underworld but also as i said the underworld spins around and also jumps or plays with the with the heavens and that is expressed in the duality of the day and the night you know when the day comes and the sun is ruling in the sky you're talking about those are the heavens the sky is up there but when the sun goes down and gets into the underworld the underworld takes over and then the night is above right so the underworld kind of like also comes there in a symbolic way but when you talk about what is below our feet you know the underworld is also the place where things grow from when you plant your corn your maize when you plant your beans or anything that you were going to harvest in agriculture it always grows from bottom to top you never see anything growing from top to bottom. Nothing falls really from the sky except from rain. And that is amazing, no? So Underworld didn't have that negative connotation. Underworld was entirely a positive connotation as well, no? Or mostly a positive connotation as well. And that would represent or was represented too within the whole idea of the pyramid in this case or the temple of the moon, no? So we were saying uh, Teotihuacan Teotihuacan was like, it was first built about 2000 years ago, just before, before Christ, about 100 years before Christ. And then in a very short period of time, they were able to establish and, and decide that they would, they would remain here for a long, long time. No? So the total span of Teotihuacan's activity, starting in year 100 before Christ, was finished by year 700 after Christ. So we're talking about a window of 800 years of Teotihuacan expression and Teotihuacan presence. I would like to share with all of you guys another important thing which talks about the different moments in pre-Hispanic or Mesoamerican history that has been written down by scholars and academics now. I'm going to take the mask off just a yeah. little bit. Um, so uh, th this concept or this, this, uh, this measuring of, of, uh, of history is divided in three the pre-classic period, the classic period, and the post-classic period, very much inspired in the, the concept of the classics right. in Greece and, and, and in, in the Mediterranean areas. No? So the pre-classic period here starts with the Olmecs about uh, 4,500 years ago. Those were the first, so, so far the first known civilization to establish and create culture, architecture, stop the nomadic events and become sedentary, start with a calendar, start with a language, start with an alphabet or, or a com uh, uh, better said uh, a different uh, writing techniques of hieroglyphs and stuff like that no right. that pre-classic period started with the piling up the comprising you no know, the compilation of knowledge science technique that was finally finding its glory mm. in the classic period and that is teotihuacan teotihuacan is the beacon of the sprout of the flowering 
of the of the classic period so that means that all those science those techniques the calendar the language the architecture the cosmovision the spirituality was finally getting to like very 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 powerful levels okay fascinating so we're going to continue on with this recorded version right now and then we're going to try to attempt to go live close to the pyramid of the sun maybe a little bit better there so uh one thing i'm curious you mentioned that there were uh, uh they went underground Yes. So are there, are there uh, chambers in here that go underground? That's right. Yes. Ooh. And is this, this is proven? There's evidence? Yes, that there's evidence. Okay. In fact, uh, right here we have one of the sites that was explored very recently. Even 40 years ago, archaeologists were still working in this site. They, were, they removed some of uh, the remains of like this. You can see the, the, the small structure in the middle. Mm. This structure here known as Queen Kunsen, it's also a, a, a very symbolic uh, piece of architecture here that was wor used for many purposes, probably. Right. But the, the point is that when they opened up this uh, hole or shaft down here, they were able to find the tunnel that takes you underground and underneath the pyramid right to its axis, to the center part of it. Oh, fascinating. And that's how, in a way, they discovered not only all the remains of archaeological production in terms of pottery, obsidian carving, because mm. these, these Teotihuacans, they were also very close to the, the quarries and the banks of obsidian. They were the producers and the most important uh, merchants of obsidian around that time, 2000 years ago, they would commerce with this gem. There used to be three uh, precious stones in all of the Americas. There were the, the three most common ones were jade, mm -hmm. turquoise and obsidian. Turquoise from, from the north, from, uh, from Arizona and from northern states in the North American region. Mm -hmm. Jade from the bottom, from the jung jungle and the rainforest in Mexico and the Central American part of the Mayan and obsidian right in right. the middle where the volcanoes are found, okay? Oh. So those are also remains that were found in the tunnel. The tunnel takes you down and underneath, and they were able to also recognize that the Temple of the Moon was built, to, com to have it completely as it is today, was built in seven different phases of construction. That means that the Teotihuacan, we have discovered so far, that they were building their own city, like enhancing the city over its own city, or over itself, several times in history. That means that they started with one uh, structure and then after a while they built around and on top of that structure to make it bigger and enhance the whole thing. So we have several Teotihuacans within the visible Teotihuacan today and the wow. Temple of the Moon is a good example of that. So in urban design terms that would be known as uh, reuse. Um, so you would reuse the, the same type of structure over and over. Again. Exactly. Adaptive reuse, that's the full term. Adaptive reuse, yeah. exactly. Adaptive right. re reuse of the material. Yeah. And also it has a symbolic context uh, saying that instead of what we would do now, which would be destroy or like condemn the building, demolish the place and then build something new in the same location, they would respect the previous uh, structure, also kind of like using it as the foundation of the following thing. And that was also very logical after the observation of life. No, mm -hmm. Before you become a, a man or a woman, you're a child and before you're a baby and before you are inside your mother's womb. And that order is always progressive, never changes. So you need one uh, stage to get to the other one. Right. And that one could be symbolized also in this architectural style as well. Wow. So let's continue walking around. This sure. is amazing. And um, so uh, a favorite topic of many people who come to Mexico City is, of course, Aztec ritual sacrifice. Yes. Did, did it happen here? Well, they weren't Aztecs, they were Teotihuacanos. Yeah. Was there any evidence that they did that here? Yes, there is evidence that they did that here. Uh, there's evidence with, with materials, with tools, no? with blades of, made of obsidian, also the, the, the famous knives no? uh, right. made of that material. But apart from that, the, the most interesting or, or, or compelling like, evidence is the burial scenes, mm. the, the, the tombs that have been found. Or more than tombs, they are considered offerings. This means the remains of humans, no? the, 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 the human remains that have been found on every single of these three major structures here, you know, which we will see actually in a moment, we will discover that they are also part of what we call landscape architecture. You know? oh, we'll see that in a second, it's fascinating. But all of them, the Temple of the Moon, Sun, and the Temple of the Feathered Serpent or Quetzalcoatl, they all, the three of them, have the presence of these remains on both sides or on the four sides of the temple. Mm. We believe those sacrifices... Yeah. yeah, let's get closer, of course. We believe that those sacrifices were happening uh, either to, to ask for the success of the project, yeah. like say, 
we're going to build this for a major purpose. So we want to make this offering as we are building this so that that major purpose, in this case, this concept of fertility or life or life giving figure like the sacred feminine, you know, the mm. goddess of fertility, so to say, known here as Chalchiutlique, would favor the people with the completion of the project. So they would sacrifice someone in relation to that. No? Or differently, it would be once the, the, the whole thing was finished and the temple existed already as its symbol, symbolic purpose of connecting the underworld with the heavens as well, yeah. in this sacred shape of a mountain, oh, then they would bring the, the offering of that one that was sacrificed because the most important, precious belonging or possession for these civilizations, no matter what time, so Aztec, Teotihuacans, Mayans or whoever, Toltecs, mm -hmm. it was human blood. Above jade, turquoise, and, and obsidian, and above gold, it was human blood. Or chocolate and, beans. Or chocolate beans, exactly. <laughs> yeah, chocolate beans was also very used as ca currency. Right. You know, like, let's see, <laughs> if I don't have any chocolate, I'll give you a few drops of my blood, and we are even. <laughs> that would be also. <laughs> right. But then the, the point of like bringing that precious liquid, which is our uh, uh, feathered serpent stream inside of us, no? mm. what makes the, the motion. As long as we have the, the beating heart and the blood going around, we will be able to experience life. That was going to be our best possession and that was going to be our best gift or offering to whoever was dedicated this building to. Mm -hmm. If you look over there, yeah. that one is just another one of these little ones here, but it doesn't have any sign of reconstruction, you see? Right. That one it was looks left just like, like that. A hill. It just it like, looks it just like, like a hill, yeah. exactly. Similar to what people would have confused for hills in Palenque or, exactly. or nearby That's um, right. Mayan cities. Yeah. Though that one was left uh, unexcavated, was left like that, mm. so that you could see the difference between how Teotihuacan was found in the, in the middle 1800s mm. and how it is now. And also because they ran out of money to complete the excavation. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 but you can see how you know, Teotihuacan's first explorings were made by the, by the Mexica themselves. They came here, they knew about Teotihuacan, they were able to pinpoint it in, in a map, they mm. located it. They took some of the obsidian works that they found here and brought them back to Mexico City and then used the obsidian also as a, ma as a material for their own artistic production. But they spent some time here and that's why and that's when they gave also this association, mythological powerful association to Teotihuacan, mm. saying that the sun and the moon were created here millions of years ago or, or a long, long time ago. But they just used the place as, a, as the location for this mythological event, no? Did they have a certain time and date frame of the age of the universe? No. No? No, like, okay. like, like, a, like in, a, in, in, in the calendar number? Yeah. No, they said, well, they said like in, when that happened, when the sun and the moon were, this, on the, this sun and moon were created, right. that happened here in Teotihuacan with a bonfire, oh. so to say. But uh, the, the, the cool thing in this case is that after that, there were other explorings happening, even by colonial members, but they were never able to really fully uh, excavate and, and bring out all of what we have today. That only just happened in the 1860s. Right. That's when the in intensive archaeological work, mostly by foreigners, started to happen. Oh. No? So we're talking about a place that was built 2000 years ago. Yeah. It was abandoned about 1,300 years ago, no, in year 700, around. And then it was refound re and re-explored and, and, and excavated out just 150 years ago. So we're talking about like the amount of time that is separating us today yeah. from those people that put all these rocks together and also the piling up of dirt because that's part of the ar architectural So design. even for the Magica uh, slash Aztecs, they would be uh, as to them, it would seem like such an ancient city as That's well. That's correct, yes. Oh. It would be their ancestors in ancestors. a way, no? Oh. Yeah, the Mexica made it to the basin and, and to the high plateau, what we call the high plains of Mexico, mm -hmm. which is Teotihuacan is part of it somehow. The Mexica made it in the 1200s. Mm. So that was already 500 years after Teotihuacan was abandoned. Mm. Long time, right? So here we see, here we can even see the, the mountain. Yeah, this is the this is the, the the staircase, the steps that will take you to the platform attached to the Temple of the Moon that from here cannot be seen. Yeah. But as we will be walking out away, we will be able to see the whole. Well, we already saw it before, but the whole and majestic, like precious work of the of the pyramid. No. Mm. Wow. I'm gonna show you oh. this side also. How tall is it? This one is. It's about uh, 180 feet. 180 feet. Okay. And Temple of the Sun is about 200 feet mm. tall. 
here's part of like if you could see the angle this here's oh, yeah. part of the of the side of the pyramid of the temple of the moon so it has a little bit more shape than uh the pyramids of giza yeah a actually little bit yeah, more sides right more sides and and more angles it, we we need to say that part of what you're looking at right now was yeah. also kind of like replaced in in its location the rocks were replaced after the excavation okay it turns out that when you look at this for instance we're looking at the we're looking at the uh, the volcanic stones which would work as the bricks of the construction behind them we either have a, a, a previous phase of construction so a smaller structure or we have uh, the dirt bricks mm. like piled up adobe bricks no after the, the 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 rocks come they put the plaster of stucco and this white that you're looking at here is authentic color white the palette of colors of the Teotihuacan okay. is coming from different plants different rocks as well like limestone would create a chemical reaction changing colors on different petal fl mm. uh, flowers petals and insects like the cochinilla roly-poly uh, eggs as well tobacco mm. leaves and many other mineral natural and uh, rock uh, uh, materials right wow. the white then would be covered up but then you can see how so life authentic. is emerging yeah, yeah that's authentic oh, wow. life is emerging so when they excavated, you know, the archaeologists were bringing out these constructions, they needed to remove the extra uh, cacti, trees, bushes. Yeah. And sometimes they would bring the remaining stucco out of. It was damaging the structure. Mm. So once they finished the excavation, they replaced some of the rocks. And what we're looking at here is a combination of all, some of the phases of completion of the Temple of the Moon mm. to come up to the total of seven. But we can see how perfectly angled they are in, in the shape of them, no? Yeah, they it's, had good mathematical pro uh, precise. Precise, yes, yeah. and symmet symmetrical precise as well. On this side, it's important because on the right side of the Temple of the Moon, they found the burial scene of, uh, of a number of like, warriors, no? Yeah they were buried uh, looking into the east and they were buried Sorry, with a very beautiful I, i'm very distracted by the by the by the feather, feather because you're talking about we talked about quetzalcoatl earlier yes and here it is and no here like, it is. That's and, and, fascinating. and okay. quetzalcoatl was also associated to the wind <laughs> yeah the feathered serpent no that's amazing that's yeah that's, that's a magical <laughs> moment <laughs> for all of you guys so anyway, the yeah. things that the, the, the offerings that were found connecting to the to the to the tombs or the offerings, the burial scenes of these people, no, these warriors, have been considered to be possibly Mayan. Some of the traces of organic remains coming from either their teeth or their bones have been able to, you know, with all this forensic super science that we have now, been able to trace some of the materials to far distances in the south reaching down to Tikal in Guatemala. So here comes wow. one cool fact now noted and, and, and provable is that the Teotihuacans and the people in the Mayans in Tikal were acquainted mm. in touch and having very intensive political and social interactions, commercial interactions as well. So those guys were, were, uh, were pretty sure that they were Mayans mm. because of the jade offerings that were, they were found together with them. They were buried in a position sitting down and they were facing east towards mm. the Mayan territory like you would find the Mayan area no wow. also nearby them they excavated a major monolith monolithical sculpture today found in the Museum of Anthropology the National Museum of Anthropology back in Mexico City and that is or has been named the representation of this feminine fa force or power related to fertility water the waters of the rivers the waters of the lakes fertility and and feminine on earth no mm. that was also found on that area in that proximity and then moved into the anthropology museum so we get there some of the uh, elements that ended up also uh, ended up also being reason or re being a justification or an excuse for calling this temple here the pyramid of the moon oh i see and Wait a minute. Um, so they added pavement recently, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Well, actually, that's a very good question. Yeah. Right. Nowadays, we don't have a lot of protection here. Yeah. But we have areas in Teotihuacan in which we can step over the actual uh, paved floor. So the Teotihuacans yeah. not only covered or plastered their walls or their monuments or their temples and palaces, they also paved their floors. So all of what we have here and all of what was the city a didn't minute. have a lot of garden really, didn't have a lot of grass or even gravel. It was paved too. And in some cases even wow. painted as well. Yeah. 
Wow, so this is all was paved. Wow. That's right. It so was it was a huge paved. open plaza. It was huge open plaza. Yeah. And you know what? Also Teotihuacan yeah. is um, it's a model. It's mm. a model of the valley. It's a model of the mm. valley itself. And it's also a model based or inspired on the human being as well. Right. We have, oh, that is really cool because the, the firecrackers are blowing now in one of the villages for some kind of religious celebration. Yeah. But one of the cool things about this plaza is the acoustic properties that it has. It does, it bounces the sound. Bounces it, bounces the, it bounces the sound yeah. quite, a, quite a bit. I would like to try something. There's a lot of people today because it's Sunday and it's free for Mexicans to come. Okay. All the nation, the, the, the national Mexicans coming from wherever the states or the rest of the country can access for free. So let me pause you there. Here right now, we maybe have a few thousand, maybe a thousand or two maximum. Yeah. Uh, but this city was much bigger than that. Oh, yes, absolutely. So uh, on a very important day, this would be a lot more full. Right? You know, on a very important day, this would be a lot more full. Yes, yeah. that's right. Uh, we and that that would be uh, on, on considered on or I would put it on a on, on a on a side of theory yeah. because we haven't really been able to find out uh, for sure. Like we don't have the fact, as we were mentioning before. Mm -hmm. Uh, how many of the people would be involved with a certain special ritual. Right. But I'm sure that I, when, when it was something that everyone had to hear, or at least most people had to hear, they would be congregated here, uh, certainly. This is a very interesting thing as well, because this plaza, or the Temple of the Moon, is not closed, perfectly bordered, no. like the Temple of the Sun and the Temple of the Feathered Serpent. They have a perfect wall bordering or, or like walls around them so that makes them more important and also restricts the access for everyone else mm. to just come inside anytime unlike this one this one is an open space and we believe it was a lot more accessible for everyone in the city at that time again reaching up to 200,000 people potentially okay mm. i would like to try this acoustic thing let's see if we get it if i clap I My hear, clap can bounce back, around. Yeah. Exactly. He's doing it good. He's doing it. He's yeah. doing it too. So this was also. I mean, believe it or not, we are we are really willing to to believe that these these uh, shapes and these structures they were not just like this by chance. Why? Mm -hmm. Because we have found also the same acoustic properties in other uh, archaeological sites, such as Chichen Itza. It's a very powerful acoustic uh, property, especially in the ball game. So we believe that this was also intended to be like a, like a resonance box or like a natural made speaker for the, for the man with a speech up there maybe mm. or the woman with a speech up there talking to the people or for the music and the performance happening on stage right in the square in the middle of the plaza to, yeah. to be able to be enhanced without the, the need of electricity in a way. No? Right. When, when, when you are alone here or when people are like quiet or silent, uh, there's not big crowds, you clap and you get all even the sound of the bird coming back as a reply from each one of these little ones. Classic. And also the sound of your clap bounces all around. It travels around the plaza. It repeats itself. It's amazing. So when you think about drums being played here or music being played here as the, as the sound was like traveling out, then it was feedback into the same area. So it would also help the experience of probably getting into trance by dancing for hours. And here we're hearing it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go, let's go on top of here. Let's go on top of here. Okay. So do you know what this would have been? Yes, this one was a, uh, well, it is, it, is a, it is a good question because we don't know for sure. There is no fact about it. Mm. But. I, as I was saying, the, the whole side of Teotihuacan, it's also uh, based or inspired on the human body or the, the person of a, of a human being. No? Oh. The, we would believe then or we would say that the, the, the temple of the moon could resemble like the head. Yeah. And then the body, the spine goes down in an axis and then from it, the rest of the city would like just exactly. So what is this called? That one there is called the Avenue of the Dead Ooh. or the Footpath of the Dead, no? okay. the, the Walking Path of the Dead. That name was also a, a, a sign or given named by the archaeologists recently mm -hmm. and also based on uh, some uh, cosmovision or some uh, mythology from the Mexica again. So that was not the name that the Teotihuacans gave to this footpath. And in fact, it was also paved 
and may have contained a water canal as well to, for irrigation. That's something we're going to discover as wow. well. The water system for irrigation in Teotihuacan was so advanced here. that they took advantage of the accident of the actual uh, territory right here. Because it's a downward terrain. slope. Exactly, that's a downward slope. So you get the water falling from rain, mostly yeah. catching water from rain, but also brought from the, the system of caves that was created by volcanic activity millions of years ago. Mm -hmm. So the water was found in these banks underground or in caves and it was fresh water just filtered by the mountain behind the Temple of the Moon. Oh. When it, once it rained or they were able to carry water down here, they would direct the water to these canals mm -hmm. and just by gravity the water would like ramp down, sloped and by, by this gravitational force it would be able to irrigate the most important apartment compounds for people to have access to, to fresh water on, an, on, a, on a daily basis. No? Wow. So here, this stage here yeah. can be considered also something close to like your ch the, the chest or the heart. No? It is surrounded by 13, 14 smaller monuments or smaller platforms as well, shaped like pyramids around the square itself. And so here would be a place we believe for the performance of different rituals. Mm. It's important to mention that the life of the pre-Hispanic or the Mesoamerican civilizations was still very much connected to the, to the understanding of the cosmos. Mm. So life was not mm, very complicated in terms of like going into expeditions or discovering mm. remedies. It was still just about, or a matter of understanding and observing the phenomenons of life and transformation in this like a, a time lapse of going, coming the sun in and out. No? Because to them it was very circular. That's right. right. So yeah. that, that what we're trying to say is that whatever they were making, no, uh, I will put it in a, in a phrase, no? Even in Teotihuacan, or even for the Mexica, which were the final guys that met with the Spanish before the colonization and the conquest, no? mm -hmm. the, the majority of the uh, artistic expression ever made by them, so that means architecture, pottery, uh, sculpture, uh, paintings and, and glyphs, no? right. uh, it was all still just about the expression of the cosmovision. So we understand these divine forces, we name them, then represent them or personify them into these different symbols. And then the rest of the, the progress of the artwork has right. to do with, with the expression of these concepts. You know? exactly, yeah. And that, that's why we believe that in here, the rituals were consecrated or, or dedicated to celebrate or praise moments in the calendar that probably would be in a, in, in, in perspective or in desire for the rain, for fertility, for the life, for the solstice, the equinoxes, the cross-quarter days, mm -hmm. and etc. No? A lot of music That's also it. involved, no? musical cool instruments, yeah. uh, conch shell trumpets, drums. The uh, Del Tihuacanos have very small feet. <laughs> yeah, they got very small feet. <laughs> And you can see that there is access yeah. on four sides of this. Unlike right. the pyramids, the pyramids are also based in a, in a square, mm. but uh, they don't. They only have one axis in front of uh, in the front of each one of them. No, these little ones here, they are. They have access or steps to bring you up there on four sides. The square is one of the major, most important uh, geometric shapes of uh, these civilizations. Right. It was all mostly based on square. No, mm -hmm. even you see it in arts and crafts. No, folk art. Everything is based on square. Uh, on a square. Even the textile. Sometimes they don't have the curved lines. They are perfect squares. Sometimes angles. No. So in this case, the square also matches or points or, or, or coordinates with the four paths of the universe, mm. north, south, east and west. The Avenue of the Dead got that name because when the Mexica explored this place, right. the hills or the mountains that looked around, they believed they were, <laughs> excuse me, they believed they were the burial scenes or the tombs of, the, of their ancestors. Oh, fascinating. So they said, oh, the avenue where the, where the dead rest, no? Yeah. Another important connection is that in the cosmovision of, the, of, 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 of these civilizations, the north was the section or the way of the death. Once you die, you become cold, your body temperature lowers, no? Yeah. And then you start your decomposing process, no? And they believe that north was where the dead spirits or, or energy would go. Because also we get the cold winds in this part of Mexico, they come from the north. Yes. It's where the cold winds come. So that was a symbolism right there. The footpath of the dead 
goes or streams down the water, but it also gives you an idea that you are walking up to the north. Mm -hmm. This is another symbolic association, but that's also why this footpath was given that name. It, oh. it sounds spooky and, and yeah, mysterious, not like the Avenue of the Dead. Like wow. a procession. Yeah, like yeah. a procession. Like a Day of the Dead parade, no? Right. Everybody dry, dressed up <laughs> and painted with the skulls and all that makeup, no? Imagine that. So now we're going to the Temple of the Sun. Yeah, but I wanted to show you something real cool from before that, from here. Just right here, this is where we get the best perspective. I want to show you the Temple of the Sun. Oh, I see. Okay, and look at the size, it's design, it's genius. I will spoil something here, but Temple okay. of the Sun is about 80% original and there's 20% of reconstruction, especially huh. in the upper bodies, no? Okay. Like the final, final stages. They were destroyed and bombed by the archaeologists in order to excavate it and then replaced and, and, and a new level was added, according to the records. But now if you take a look at the mountain next to it, yeah. what do you see? It mimics the shape of it. Yes. Can you see that? It looks almost the same. It looks yeah. almost the same, that's yeah. right. That mountain combined with the mountain behind Temple of the Moon, both of them are the two biggest mountains found on the valley. Mm. That one is flanking the valley in the southeast and that one is crowning the valley in the north okay the remains or the rest of them in the far horizon are more like flatter no mm. they don't seem to be like rising up that high and they are all kind of like continued 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 these smaller ones that we have here guess what they are also trying to uh, model or recreate in scale the horizon of the valley of Teotihuacan. So we are looking at a Teotihuacan build within the Teotihuacan natural landscape, but by humans. That's what <laughs> yeah. they did. And the Temple of the Sun is not coincidence that it looks just like the mountain. It was also inspired on the shape of the mountain. And here comes the real thing about these temples. In the Mesoamerican people, they believed that mountains were sacred. And I want to make a stop right there because you know, uh, Ariel, that also in other cultures they praise mountains to be yes. sacred places. In Puerto Rico, they praise Yukiyu, who lived on top of uh, El Yunque. Yukiyu uh, lived on top of El Yunque in yeah. Puerto Rico, and that's yeah. a mountain. Right. Not right. to mention Olympus Mountain. Right. That was like the Beverly Hills for all the Greek gods, right? right? But it was a mountain. And then you have Sinai Mountain, where Moses got the. It, the tablets, the first tablets ever existed from God himself, no? Mm. And then you have Ararat Mountain and then you have Fuji Mountain. In America, also mountains were sacred because they are the first recipients of water. They filter the water and they gave us the rivers. Mm. The mountains are holy places. So the fact that we have landscape architecture inspired by mountains only explains the fact that these monuments are in fact also man-made mountains because those were the, pla the places or the houses of the holy. Right, right. That's the cool thing about it. Humans were trying to rebuild the natural world. And, and unlike the this. ones in, yeah. in Egypt, these ones yeah. were not tombs for someone in particular. Right. Like in this case, Cheops or the Giza no? pyramid. In this case, these ones were shrines or, 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 or connections or a, an energetic place, so to say, mm. built uh, for the worshipping, for the praising, for the gratification, for the gratitude of these transcendental forces or gods you know, it, in their cosmovision. Is there any evidence of uh, the, uh, the Teotihuacanos going to the mountains? Oh yeah, yeah? yes, in, in Plat Patlachique mountain yeah. over there, there is also archaeological remains, mm. but uh, they are not easy for, to, uh, to access. There's a big platform actually, okay. uh, built or, or, or carved as well in a giant in a big piece of rock also with with a stucco and cement that is found on Patlachique mountain no mm. it's also part of the of the Teotihuacan yeah. uh, it is also part of the Teotihuacan uh, extension right no within these 14 square miles that, uh, that uh, existed here no that ever were here in, in Teotihuacan uh, even Teotihuacan final borders were reaching out to uh, the salty lakes of Mexico City's lake area. Mm. So the Teotihuacans also had access to that lake before it was populated densely by the Mexica. So they were able to get fish, shells, uh, salt from the lake in Mexico City today. So before there was any skyscraper there, of course, no, there was no real sign of someone establishing there. That's oh. fascinating as well. Not yep. to mention that they also made it to the Gulf of Mexico and the yeah. Pacific coast. Which is very impressive. And 
Where did they live, the Teotihuacanos? The Teotihuacanos lived outside. This is the main corridor, the, the axis of, of the city. The, let's say like a parallel, no? And there were many perpendicular uh, roads or avenues as well. And then quadrants, it was built mostly like a grid. Right. Since the square was the, the basic shape, it was easy to find the repetition of the square like in a fractal way. Mm -hmm. The society of Teotihuacan was divided, not exactly in a social class division. Yes, the rulers, the priests, the elders and pregnant women, they believe, were the ones that had access to a more uh, like upper scale level in society. Mm -hmm. But there was not really a feeling of poverty or a starvation. No, it was more a society was, that was divided in a, into purpose, your purpose in life, like your your activity, what you were, what your mission was. Mm. No? So if your mission was to become a warrior and then be a warrior, you would live in the warrior area, no? right. in, the war, in the warrior neighborhood, so to say, or within the, the warriors as well. If your work was to be an artisan, which in Teotihuacan was the majority of the population, in order to be able to understand just the amount of production in pottery and, and paintings and architecture and sculpture that was ever produced in Teotihuacan in this span of 700 years, we only can tell that there were a lot of artisans involved in the production of this. You can even call it propaganda. Why propaganda? Because they were again projecting this cosmovision into their art. There was no such thing as abstract art, you know? Mm. Uh, or even landscape art. It was always about life and death and transformation and all these concepts. So uh, the, the people would live outside the main avenue in quadrants and they would be separated or divided by activities, purpose, uh, office, no, uh, profession, you can call it like that. Yeah. And then finally, in the far farther out places, the called common people would be also the ones related to the farmers. So the farmers would, um, would live in the outer part, but also because that was the closest part, uh, the closest to the, to the farms, no? to the cactus farms, to the corn, to the beans farms, to where the agriculture w was uh, taking place. Instead of walking from the center of the city to the outside of the city, you would just walk from your house directly to the farming areas. No? So what are we seeing right here? This is the, f the, the mural of the Puma. This is one of the most uh, or better preserved murals in Teotihuacan. And this is one of the most beautiful examples to me on how the city used to look like. No? This particular wall, it's nothing, according to our understanding, it would be nothing special compared to the pyramids, right? Yeah. It's just a, a small part of the Avenue of the Dead. But what we're looking at, it's an earlier stage of this construction. This one here and that wall there was meant to cover the paint and come all the way to this wall here. So we're looking at an earlier phase of decoration and, and construction of Teotihuacan in which we see the puma walking over a watery background, something like looks like, like a river or a stream of water. You know, that's what we have been able to interpret. And also we have the presence of the chalchiwit, which that's another Mexica or Aztec word, but the presence of the rings of water in this blue jadish color. That is the glyph. We know now for sure it's a water resembling leaf and it is also part of the iconography of Tlaloc. You remember him, Yes, no? yes, because he has those <coughs> huge rings. Exactly, he yeah. has like Google eyes, no? Yeah. So this one was found here in a very well shaped state. So they decided to leave it and protect it with this shelter. There is a big amount of murals from Teotihuacan right. that were removed from their location and placed in the museum right. afterwards. But the cool thing about the Puma mural, uh, Ariel, and guys, everyone, uh, is that it's walking, as you saw, it's walking away from the, from the pyramid. Yeah, it's why walking is that? in that direction. I, I think, and this is my personal interpretation, I think the puma is giving us the flow of water. Oh, I see. No, it's telling us in which way the water flows. Mm -hmm. And in this case, yes, that's thanks of the uh, slope, the water would always come from, from, the, from the north, from the top to the bottom. There is, the, there is a presence of a river down, 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 far down by the Avenue of the Dead that crosses the Avenue of the Dead and, and keeps going to the west. That river was modified, the, the Teotihuacans modified the banks of, the, of that river to make it cross the city right in the point where it crosses. And it divides this part of Teotihuacan to the Feathered Serpent Pyramid uh, area. And that river was used to collect the water as it was streaming down. Oh, so okay. the water coming from up here would eventually end up down there. 
and that was also going to be part of the sewers system of the Teotihuacans. So the wastewater, which back then was pretty much just organic waste, you know, coming from humans and food, would eventually made it, make it to the river over there and then continue its flow outside the city. Would have Pumas ventured into this city or there would have been more in the mountains? Well, you know, uh, the, the presence of, of human activity, like constant human presence, yeah anywhere in the world really pushes the fauna away. Yes. So uh, they, they, were, they would come in encounters with pumas as they were walking into areas that were still wild. Mm. When the people started to settle and they established a city like this, you know, with 14 square miles of construction, uh, architecture, e system of irrigation, uh, production of, of art, production of weapons, going into commerce, then the fauna would start to like go away. You know? Right. So the pumas were encountered more like in the wild. No? Also, that happened with the jaguars in the Mayan area. No? The Mayans, however, the Mayan cities were a complete work of uh, like a providence. No? It was like they, they had to be protected, protected by some kind of external power. I'm, I mean, I'm joking, right? Obviously, right. but I'm saying the only thing is that the, the jungle down by the Mayan region is so dense that uh, just the, just the, the just the, 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 the possibility of surviving in that rainforest and the jungle in the Mayan regions such as Palenque, mm. Ortical, the, the, the chances for you to survive the fauna there, it's like minimum. And right. the fact that they were able to not only survive, but become one of the most cult and civilized cultures of the Mesoamerican, even with that like conditions of weather, it's really mesmer it's surprising. It it's, is. It's fascinating, really. Very though. impressive as well. So the jaguars yeah. were down there. And they praised and, and, and worshipped the jaguars in the Mayans. Also, the Olmecs worshipped the, the jaguar. The jaguar is more like from the bottom of Mexico, mm -hmm. the rainforest, the jungle, getting down to Central America, Guatemala, Belize. And then from uh, Oaxaca to the north, it's the Puma land. It's the Puma, yeah. Okay. That's, that's really fascinating that uh, they worship these animals, similar to how Europeans worship, uh, or not worship, but use iconography of lions. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, it's getting windy. Yes. And we have a little dust devil. Yes. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. Who, what, what god is, is the god of wind again? Yes, uh, Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl, okay, that's Quetzalcoatl. Make your a reappearance again. Reappearance, and we <laughs> appreciate it because it was quite hot. <laughs> right. No, we need a little bit of breeze. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about the vendors. Um, there's a lot of vendors all around. Uh, what, what are they usually selling? And um, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. The the vendors. Well, you know, Teotihuacan's uh, people, the Teotihuacan people today, that it's found. The Teotihuacan is like a municipality of the state of Mexico. Yeah. And it has several different little towns, no villages. The ones that are even closer to the archaeological site. Uh, most of the population uh, population's economy is based on tourism. Right. So the Teotihuacan locals, they were taught about a hundred years ago by the former archaeologists around the times of the dictator to work with obsidian because obsidian query, queries and banks are still pretty heavy, uh, heavily uh, well, like here populated. We see, not, probably not real obsidian, but obsidian color right there. Right there. All of that is obsidian. No? Do you think this, it would be real obsidian? All that is real obsidian, oh, yes. Uh, except except for the, the white or the pale ones. Right. Only the black one is obsidian. Mm. So the locals were taught to carve the stone uh, using modern day tools in order to be able to make replicas or pieces of imagination so that they would be able to sell them here for tourists. Right. Or to tourists. <laughs> <laughs> the jaguar whistle is a very recent invention in reality. The ones that are copies of the originals are the ones that are uh, the whistles yeah, let's move over and here. the flutes. Okay, so we're going to go live for about 10 minutes just in one spot. Okay. To talk about this. And we won't be moving from this spot. Okay, sure. Are we doing, are we doing okay? We're doing awesome. I love it. Great. So uh, continue talking just a little bit lightly about um, the surrounding area before we talk about the period. Of the or, or the vendors too, no? Like the vendors, yeah. Put to the camera. Okay. So yeah, I, we have we have made it now to this. Uh, this is one of the. This is the access. One of the accesses to the Temple of the Sun, the Great Temple of the Sun. This is the third largest pyramid in the world. We'll say that. Uh, and this is how or where the most most people is, would be like found the main access 
to the, the Sun's Temple Square, no? We were just having a conversation about the vendors and we, I was explaining that the people, the locals in Teotihuacan, uh, their economy is mostly uh, based on tourism. And it's been like that for about 100 years now, no? There's a lot of other commerce and industries also happening in Teotihuacan, of course. But one of the major thing is that this place is open every day of the year. It actually closed because of COVID, but uh, they have found uh, generation by generation they have found a way to keep alive or preserve the techniques of carving the obsidian stone, making replicas of the famous pieces found here belonging to the Teotihuacans or belonging to other uh, Mesoamerican cultures as well, just as the Mayan of them or the Mexica. So the vendors are like a union. They are very well organized. They are approved by the Ministry of Anthropology and History, which is the authority in the site. They are given a permission, a license, and they are allowed to set or choose one spot along the entire archaeological site which by the way I mentioned it's only 8% from the total uh, span of the 14 square miles that it was once was Teotihuacan so uh, it also looks like a like a live open market if you take a look quickly over there you no know, uh, every like here we start with some of these vendors offering fabrics textiles embroideries coming not only from Teotihuacan but from also the state of Hidalgo but as you see the rest of the Avenue of the Dead every person with these big hats just like the ones we have over here with these two men all of them they are offering different carvings and different pieces made of obsidian and a variety of different stones just as volcanic rocks or tiger eye or lapis or moonstone or well you name it no like what's the other uh, venturine as well they use all these different either quartz or, or precious stones or beautiful gems to put together the, the, the replicas and the pieces they offer to the people traveling, you know, the visitors of Teotihuacan. And we're going to be going live very shortly, as soon as we're ready. We're going to be streaming live for our friends in, in the rest of the world, outside Mexico and within Mexico. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Where, where, how did you start becoming a tour guide and an anthropologist? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I, uh, I, I became a, that's a good question, thank you. Uh, the story is really uh, interesting, it's fascinating, and it has a couple of uh, cool things as well. But it all started with me being a, like a curious uh, little boy, you know. I was always looking for answers, asking questions, questioning society, questioning stuff. And I, I remember I used to spend times like just looking in the, into the sky or the ceiling of my bedroom, uh, trying to find answers to some of the most basic questions of humankind, you know. Of course, like what, who we are, where we come from, where are we going, etc. I studied a little bit of philosophy. I did a, a, a study in University of Philosophy. I sadly wasn't able to finish. Then I pursued a musical career and I spent most of my 20s uh, working so that I could pay for my musical career, my musical project, as I was also doing self-taught and research in history of Mexico, culture of Mexico. But there was also one important thing. I have an uncle. This uncle is a teacher of the Faculty of Arts. He was the one that first introduced me to the Mexican history, to the culture of Mexico, and he was the first tour guide for me. So what we're going to do here is uh, this chat. Give us an overview of where we're standing right now, and then we're going to talk about the Pyramid of the Sun. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're standing on one of the axes. This is uh, the, the, the Pyramid of the Sun. We know now that it's uh, the oldest or the first uh, building that was uh, completed or that the, they, they started to build first. OK, so it was even uh, in, in time before the project of the Temple of the Moon. OK, mm. and it also has a special uh, consideration because the whole temple is bordered or by a, by a wall. So we are standing in the top of the wall that protects and borders the Temple of the Sun. And it is also one of its main uh, and major accesses to it. Okay. So they actually built a wall to protect it. Fascinating. Yeah. It is in a way for protection, but also for distinction to make it uh, exclusive, so yeah. to say. Oh, fascinating. Okay. So this plaza was uh, basically a sunken plaza. Exactly. Uh, yeah. A sunken plaza. Yeah. And then even ne like right next to the Temple of the Sun, right at the very border, yeah. the edge of it in its foundation or it's in, in its base, there is like a, another sunken area that would yeah. actually resemble like a moat. Oh, like, like the ones that used to be around castles in the medieval times. No? Yeah. And you had to cross a bridge to get into the castle because there was a tank around the castle. Similar to, the, to that, it happened here. Mm -hmm. not, but for all, not for only reason, but for the collection or the, 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 uh, the, ap the appropriation or the advantage of taking advantage of water, mm -hmm. rainwater also falling or streaming down from the pyramid. So if we, were, if we were to get closer even from there, we would see the mouth shape around the temple. No? 
the wall that was protecting it, it was also to make it exclusive because of the celebrations and the things that would happen in the Temple of the Sun were only available or only uh, some only only some person would be eligible right. to be part of it, right? And and that's why there is a protection or there is a separation from the rest. No, unlike the Temple of the Moon that we spent some time before, that it's pretty open there. Everyone was able to procession and travel up the Avenue of the Dead to get to the Temple of the Moon. Okay, yeah. this is the third largest pyramid in the world, by the way, at least in its base. The first one would be the Cheops Pyramid in Giza in Egypt. And it's also, I mean, it's, it's greatly bigger than this one, the one in Egypt in terms of like taller. Mm -hmm. But then the second large uh, pyramid in the world would be the Pyramid of Cholula, which is also found in Mexico, uh, mm -hmm. just an hour and a half away, southeast or well, southeast, southeast of Mexico City. The Cholula Pyramid was built in stages as well, yeah. and it resembled a hill. Now it has a giant, well, not a giant, a little, a little church on top of that pyramid. That one, it's a little more than 250 meters on each side, on its base, second largest pyramid in the world. The third largest pyramid in the world, it's the Temple of the Sun in its base, and it's, it reaches a height of 200 feet tall. So when you say large, what do you mean? Large by perimeter or large perimeter, by height? Perimeter, like on its base. Okay. On and its base. by height, it's also, in this case, uh, by height will be the third, uh, the second in Mexico, just after the one in Cholula. So Giza is still the first. Yes. Rains. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, wow, that's that's quite impressive. So just to the scale of this, two two hundred feet, it's bigger than the Statue of Liberty. Uh, yes. In New York, uh, and it's bigger. It's almost as tall as most high rises in Mexico City. Almost as yeah. tall as most high rises in Mexico City. Yeah. That's right. Except for the, maybe the most recent ones, which are right. slightly higher because of engineering uh, accomplishments, of course, not like uh, discoveries. But uh, yes, it's actually it's so big that you can actually see this. These ones are visible from several miles away uh, in distance as you are approaching the site. Yes. So that's how uh, big and, 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 and dense they are, especially when you're talking about the landscape. No? It's breathtaking seeing it from the highway. Absolutely. And now it would be even more yeah. breathtaking if we could tell your audience also, just yes. try to not close your eyes because then you wouldn't see what we're looking at. Yeah. But I would tell you, just try to imagine this thing being perfectly covered in plaster and then painted. <laughs> painted as yes. well. Yes. Okay. So it's like imagine those Greek great um, uh, sculptures that are made in marble and they are all white today. Right. We now know that in the past, long time ago, they were also painted. They looked like like they had the black black hair and the uh, white skin and whatever. But then the paint was faded or washed away. We only get the marble. Mm -hmm. Similar in this case, we are looking only at the raw materials of construction, which is the volcanic stone. But all the sticking out rocks that you probably see that are kind of like dots found on the facade of the pyramid, those were used as a grid and as a scaffold system for the builders to be able to plaster the faces of the pyramid and then be able to paint on it. No? Yeah. We believe that at the point at the pinnacle of Teotihuacan, this temple was mostly painted in a combination of red and white color, mm -hmm. red, white and blue colors. And then the Temple of the Moon would be covered in paint, but favoring more the white color instead of the red color, no? the, the white and the blue color instead of the red color. So just try to imagine for a second that at the pinnacle of Teotihuacan, you could not see the volcanic rocks at all. It was all covered in plaster, all painted, just like the mural of the Puma we saw before. Right? Fascinating. So B. Griffin asked a question that we're already answering on the HD video. Uh, yes, they are made out of different uh, facets like they made a smaller period pyramid then they made a bigger one and a bigger one and a bigger one yeah. yes in the in the case of the temple of the sun several tunnels were opened to yeah. see or try to find those previous stages and that's why we know that that was a first technique of architecture the temple of the sun doesn't have those layers within yeah. this one was built more stacking or piling up the levels above the previous one mm. and it's perfectly solid inside there's no chambers no tunnels no rooms so this was like a first technique or style and then they started making the other one which was uh, using the faces of the pyramid right. but one question that could be also answered connecting to what you said is that this temple also has its own tunnel underneath that takes you right into the bottom and underneath the pyramid to a, a great chamber yeah. with four rooms on it, almost shaped like one of the most famous and beautiful glyphs of the Teotihuacan people, Ooh. which was the four petal flower. Take advantage of that. Awesome. I brought something I brought with me right now Sunshine. to show you that. Thank you so much for becoming a new member, Sunshine. New super urbanist. Everyone send hearts to Sunshine. 
This guy is a copy of one of the paintings. So let me uh, interrupt you there. Uh, Mandy, these are the colors that we will have seen on the walls. That's right. Yeah. These are the colors we would have seen on the walls. And this is the four petal flower, which was one of the most sacred uh, glyphs or mm. symbols of the Teotihuacan people that survived till the Aztec times. It's a symbol that brings together the four paths of the universe, probably the four elements of life and, and all in an axis of life. This is the shape that is, it has wow. the chamber Wait, underneath. Let me, let me hold this right next to the pyramid so people could get a sense of how it could have been colored. That's right. Uh, no one knows for sure exactly exactly. No what one knows for sure, but yeah. this one comes from a, from a, a piece of pottery and a right. wall also found in Teotihuacan. So this is mm. entirely Teotihuacan. But and what I'm saying is that the chamber chamber underneath has that shape. Once you get it to the to the chamber, it has four rooms that resemble the four petal flower, mm. the four paths of the universe and the underworld where the water would be reserved, the reservoirs of water kept by the mountains that become a river. Well, uh, Rodrigo, what can people find you? on Mexico Underground. Yeah, you can find yeah. me on MX, it's MX Underground, uh, the social media that you can find me also through my Instagram personal one. It's it's Raw Duluz. That would be R-O-O-D-U-L-U-O-Z. So R-O-O-D-U-L-U-O-Z in Zebra. And that's that's my personal Instagram. You can find me there, yes. Or through MX Underground as well, happily. Oh, awesome, and be sure to leave uh, Mexico Underground five-star review uh, if you really enjoyed this tour on TripAdvisor. Uh, you don't need to mention that it's a live stream. You could mention it as if you were here. And also, thank you so much for tuning in. Keep being awesome and always keep on exploring.